Bismillah, elhamdülillah, ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah, ve alihi ve sahbihi ve man wala, ve Ramadan Kerim. Once again we've been welcomed through the portals of this generous and uh, always astonishing month. And we find ourselves in a different kind of life, a different kind of experience, breathing a different air. And change is always good for us. Uh, through endless, mediocre sameness, there is a certain uh, rotting of the soul. So this change is something that is really part of the benefit of the, of the month. And since this is the uh, age where we are told to celebrate diversity, <coughs> diversity in our forms of life is something that is uh, particularly timely in the case of our welcoming this blessed month. So. At the college, uh, we have been reflecting on a number of things this year, and as this month changes our uh, pattern of work, the students are still here, the staff are still here, the timing is a little bit different. <clears throat> but alhamdulillah, I think in many cases, students find that they work better when they're fasting, somehow there are fewer distractions. That uh, we've been reflecting on uh, purgation, Often nowadays we feel that we are overweight in too many ways. We are carrying a lot, not just uh, an excess uh, around the midriff, but uh, also too much going on in our lives. Too many plates to spin, too many engagements to keep. Uh, and this can be quite uh, difficult for those who try to maintain a spiritual mindfulness and focus. In the month of Ramadan, uh, through Allah's grace, many of those distractions are taken away because many of our sort of more usual routines to do with uh, physical sustenance are simply not there any longer. Uh, the desk is cleared, as it were. It's quite a Zen time. But nonetheless, we find ourselves weighed down <coughs> by so many distractions. And this is quite a useful time of year to take stock to clean out the attic, to engage in spring cleaning, to think about what we need and what we probably will never need and throw out, or better still, give to the food bank or give to the charity shop that uh, which others will benefit from more than we could. And there is in this divestment, this tejreed, to use the traditional Islamic term, uh, a tremendous uh, sense of lightening of the heart, that we are not carrying so much. Naja al mukhifun is the Arab proverb, which means something like, those who travel light reach the destination more easily. Naja al mukhifun literally, those who make light are saved. So one of the most useful things we can do for the rest of the year in the month of Ramadan is to see which of our worldly activities and uh, encumbrances we would be better off without? Will the ship of our Islam float uh, more safely if we throw overboard some unnecessary weights? Well, one thing that we can certainly do is to think about <clears throat> uh, the appalling inequalities which are constantly growing in today's world. And just contemplating them and not doing anything about them within one's own compass and capacity is another weight that drags us down, <clears throat> adds to our sense of guilt and shame. Too often Muslims who migrate perhaps for religious reasons or perhaps for worldly reasons find themselves encumbered. Hmm? Their arteries are clogged. They just have too much of that dunya for which they migrated. And this leads to sometimes mental health issues, sometimes a general sense of anxiety. Uh, somehow, the more we have, <coughs> the less tawakkul we seem able to cultivate. Logically, it might have to be the other way around, but uh, this tends to be the way it is. With, with too much in our accounts and our pockets and our credit card balances, <coughs> more than we could reasonably need, there is a certain hardening of the arteries of the spiritual heart, and we feel this. 
So in the month of Ramadan, when we are attempting this tajreed, trying to lose some weight, I suppose, physically, uh, we also need to think about how we can lighten our ship as we move through life. This is something that is stressed very much in the Holy Qur'an, and sometimes we cringe or recoil when we look at some of the absoluteness of its language. Many of the earliest verses of the Holy Qur'an were inveighing against the wealth of the Meccan plutocrats who were engaged in al takathur. That's so amazing, it's just two words, al takathur. <coughs> And it sums up the entirety of what most human life nowadays is about. Rivalry in worldly increase has distracted you. <laughs> you can't get it into English in less than about eight words. This is part of the telegraphic condensed brilliance of, of Allah's speech. al So this is about rivalry in worldly increase because we want a car that looks as good as the car parked outside the neighbour next door. <laughs> Uh, but we also want the increase itself, more stuff, and this distracts us. Lahu, al hakum. Lahu is a kind of game, it's like a sport, it's like a trivial pastime, it's like killing time. But we've been distracted by this worldly increase from the things that actually really make us happy. What really makes us happy in life? <coughs> Faith, family, friends, things like that. And those are not really conditioned upon how much you have in your bank balance. Family is so much more important than all of the striving we do for worldly increase. Go to any graveyard of any religion and you'll see what is on people's gravestones. It's about God and it's about family. It'll say a much missed grandfather or nan or that's always the language. It doesn't say huh, the late lamented <coughs> managed to become chief executive of the personnel department at Unilever. You never see that on a gravestone. So this capitalistic society is moving us away from what in the end, until we visit the graves, Hatta Zurtumul Maqabir turns out to be the most important thing. When everything else is stripped away, we realise what is important. It's not going to be uh, the head of HR who's sitting at your deathbed. It's going to be your nearest and dearest. And it's going to be, inshallah, the angels. So Allah uses some quite uh, hard language when he speaks of this, and this human tendency to avoid what actually makes them happy and what is important because we're distracted by the, the glitter of, of the gold. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ يَبْخَلُونَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ بَلْ هُوَ شَرٌ لَهُمْ سَيُطَوَّقُونَ مَا بَخِلُوا بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَلِلَّهِ مِيرَاثُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ I myself find these verses challenging. It's hard to measure oneself up against the high standards um, that they demand. It says something like, uh, let not those who have been given a portion of Allah's generosity think uh, that if they are miserly with it, that it is better for them. In fact, that is worse for them. It will be hung around their necks uh, on the day of judgment. And Allah's is the inheritance of the heavens and the earth, and he is all-knowing of what you do. <laughs> the Sahaba would never read beyond a verse until they had assimilated its meaning, and the meaning here is quite challenging. It's unarguable. If when there is starvation and hunger and need, increasingly in this country, there's food poverty in the UK, um, if we are anxious about when we will be able to buy the new BMW, there is something wrong with us. And the happiness that we think that that car will bring to us and the status and the successful competition for worldly increase and what people will say about us as we glide obliviously past them <coughs> uh, 
will not be a happiness equivalent to the happiness that we experience when sincerely we express our human solidarity with those who are less fortunate than, than ourselves. To give mm, is to gain. La yanqusu manun in sadaqa, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No wealth is decreased by sadaqa. And anybody who has the habit of sincere, not absent-minded or ostentatious uh, charity giving, uh, no one who has been in that state misunderstands it or uh, underestimates it. It's a real thing. Uh, just two days ago, somebody I'd never seen before came up to me in the mosque and said they had a hundred pounds left in their account, but they were really their hearts were bleeding because of what's happening in Syria and Turkey because of the earthquake. And so they gave 50 pounds out of their last 100 pounds to charity to support those, those people. A few hours later, 8,000 pounds arrived in this person's account. <laughs> it was an accidental repayment of some student loan long ago and it just popped up and she was almost in tears because she'd seen the, the truth of this that are a ridiculous accountancy whereby we calculate profit and loss isn't, isn't real. We're not really in control of uh, money. Even the economists, even the Bank of England is not in charge of the economy. <laughs> it's not possible. Uh, Allah's is the, uh, is the inheritance of the heavens and the earth. Everything comes from him. Everything is on loan to him. And if we are generous, and if we lose some weight, if we engage in some kind of <coughs> financial liposuction, we'll feel better for it. So this aspect, this very challenging aspect of the Holy Prophet's career, one of the great heroes of history, the great hero of history, who changed history more than any other man, lived in conditions of very considerable simplicity, shall we say. لا يبيت عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم درهم ولا دينار. No coin spent the night in his house. <laughs> and we're worrying about financial planning for the next five years, and <laughs> he didn't. He was just thinking about uh, the moment. Uh, one of the great ones of, of our history, Hatim al Asam, lived in a life of real poverty and he just loved to give and to give and it was his great joy to give. <clears throat> and somebody said, well, don't you feel a bit inferior when you walk past the Sultan's palace? <laughs> and he said, the only difference between me and the Sultan is one day. I said, what do you mean? And he said, yesterday, the Sultan had what he had and I had what he had, but that's finished and he can't go back to it. Tomorrow he will have, or he may have, what he will have, or what he may have, but he's not got that now, so I'm the same <laughs> as him. The only difference is today, right now. <laughs> a day is just a day. So this is a different way of thinking, and it's hard to school ourselves in this prophetic mindset and to understand what it would be like to be so happy and to be so poor, but to be poor as uh, the ulama say, faqr, Ikhtiyari, uh, voluntary poverty, giving and giving and giving, while maintaining, and this is the sharia requirement, enough for one's dependence. You can't allow your own baby to, to be thirsty. But nonetheless, all of the excess, this extraordinary istifadat al-mal, this incredible cornucopia of money that somehow doesn't have much baraka in it, that's just gushing forth from the earth at the moment, that so many are experiencing and living in, and some Muslim elites are certainly living in it. Uh, there are Muslim oligarchs and Muslims who aren't generous enough with the fadl that Allah has given them. And we need to think about, uh, try and remember the joy that is the consequence of sincere giving that nobody knows about. Mm. And to try, during this Ramadan in particular, to create a list of recipients. Maybe if we're from Bangladesh or somewhere, you know somebody back home for whom a hundred pounds would be extraordinary. Well, don't forget that person is kind of stuck there. You have the good passport, the job. Mm, you will be called to account for your determination to 
hoard what you should be giving. There are charities. We can take outstanding orders. You can support CMC and support the next generation of Muslim scholars, which is kind of sadaqa jariya that goes on, inshallah, for as long as their scholars live and their students live and their families live and there's a kind of self-replicating <coughs> sadaqa. This is a religion of ilma. But you should also remember the poor, the destitute, the needy, the earthquake victims, the rising sea level victims, that this is a, a world of very great suffering. And this, we have a, a generous God who rewards us in unimaginable ways, not least in a certain lightness in the heart when we give, and when we give sincerely and with hudur, with presence. So since this is a month in which uh, good deeds are multiplied, let us think about this and remember uh, that the pleasures that come from spiritual acts are always better for us than the pleasures that come from physical acts. And those that come from physical acts, sooner or later you get <laughs> overwhelmed by them and you become sick. But with the sweetness that comes from spiritual acts, you just become better and better and stronger and stronger. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return to this ummah, the spirit of sharing, the spirit of solidarity, the spirit of mercy, because all wealth is Allah's wealth. We hold it only on trust and we will be accountable for every last penny, for every last cent. May Allah give you a great Ramadan and a peaceful Ramadan and a family Ramadan and lift your sorrows and your suffering and your anxieties and inspire in all of us the spirit of giving, which is part of the beauty of the prophetic spirit. Barakallahu feekum, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for learning with us. At Cambridge Muslim College, we are raising the standard of Muslim scholarship through talks like these, but also through our certified academic programs. We're training our students to speak to our times and to meet the needs of our communities. But we can't do this without your help. Whether it's zakat, a one-off donation, or a regular contribution, your gift will help us educate more students, elevate new leaders, and illuminate entire communities for generations to come.